G'day there, you're watching the Aussie Boom Guru and today you've reached part 8 of my Python Quick Tip series and in this episode we're going to be looking at something really important which is loops, um, specifically the for and the while loops. So these are really important in Python, um, most people will use these all the time when they're working on lists and other data types. So lists, uh, loops are essentially a form of iteration which simply put is the repetition of a process to generate an outcome. So looping is essentially a bit like this. If you have a whole set of elements, you're basically telling something to happen to each of those elements. They could be in a list or other data types that are similar to a list structure. So this is why we use lo loops, because if, if you look at this example, say a list with numbers from one through to four, if we multiply this list by five, it doesn't multiply every item in the list by five and return one list. It actually returns five copies of the list. So again, it's sort of a useful function in some scenarios, but in this case, it's not probably what we want to do. What we really want to do is take each item in that list and individually operate upon each of its elements. So we're going to use the for loop. So this is one of the most important functions in Python. Um, it, it essentially looks a little bit like the syntax for this and that and this or I or whatever you call it, that can be anything. It can be A, B, C, D, um, as long as it's not a reserved namespace, it can be fine because essentially that becomes a local variable that can be referred to in the looping process. So if you've got a list, I refers to each item in that list as a variable inside that, fun inside that, um, that loop. So it's really important to understand that. People tend to use I, I assume for item, um, that's a really common thing, so for I in an object. Um, but this is what it means, so you're taking that and you're calling each item inside it I and operating on it in the loop. Keep in mind that if you're working with lists within lists, the loop isn't going to jump right down into the bottom of the list structure. It's only going to go one level down. So if you're operating on a list within a list, you might need to nest a for loop within another for loop. So you might say for each list in this list, do this for each item in this list. So you might do for this, for this, and each time you'll need to nest your variable one level deeper. So here's an example of a very basic for loop. So I'm taking my list of one, two, three, four, and for each item in that list, I'm printing it. You can see that what we get out of it is four integers. So we've actually freed the items out of the list structure. You can, act, you can do it with strings as well. So you can iterate over a string and essentially what it will do is just take each letter of the strings. So there are some scenarios where this can be useful. As well as this, you've also got ranges. So ranges aren't lists, they're similar, but they're a different data type. So you can see here, if we iterate over a range, it's sort of like iterating over a list as well. So in each case, we're just printing our output at the moment, um, but we can actually build new lists using for loops. But what we need to use is the list append function. And we need to append each result to a new empty list or a list that can receive new objects. So you can see here in an example, I've got a range from one through to 10. Now let's say we just want to turn this range into a list. What you could do in, in the case of a for loop, there's other ways to do it, I think. You could just say, my list is an empty list, just two closed, closed brackets. And you can say for an item in my range, I want to take my list and append I to it, so each item in the range. And down the bottom, you can see we've got the range, we've got the list that comes out of it, and we can just check the classes of them to verify that we've generated a range, and then we've iterated over it to generate a list. Um, you can also take a definition. So you might recall a couple of videos ago, we looked at defining custom functions. So let's say I've defined a function called power and it takes a number and it exponentially raises it by the second variable, which if not specified is squared. In this case, we're taking a range, we're building an empty list and we're running a for loop over the list. And what we're doing is calling on our function within our loop. We're taking the item and we're cubing it and then we're appending the value to the list that comes out of this. So notice that I'm defining a local variable inside my loop, and I'm using i as one of the inputs into that variable. But once I go to the next line, I can use that variable instead for appending. So you can create new variables within your function. Just remember that they're local variables, so they can't be used at the global level of your script. From there, you can see we're printing the cubed numbers, um, and again, it's working. Likewise, you can nest if statements. Let's say I've got a range here and I've got a divisor of three. I want to find out which numbers in that range are a multiple of that number. So I build two empty lists. 
One is for the ones that are, and one is for the ones that aren't. I nest an if statement inside my loop. So I take every item in my loop, then I run it over an if statement to see if the remainder when divided by the divisor is equal to zero. Notice I'm calling on a global variable here. So I can actually bring global variables into loops as well. I just can't take local variables and give them back to the overall script. You can see here that we're actually determining two lists. So we're either appending uh, to the is list or the isn't list. And then I'm just outputting them at the bottom. And you can see that we successfully separate these into two lists from one, one range to begin with. Likewise, you can use try and accept. This is really useful when your list might contain multiple data types and you need to catch some of the items as you iterate over the list. So for example here, let's say I'm taking a formula and I'm just trying to add five to everything in my list, but some of these items aren't actually uh, able to have five added to them. You can see here, for example, that I have two strings hiding in this list. One is the string five and one is the string test. Then I have a float and an integer. So I can add five to the float and the integer. These are at index zero and two. And you can see that the results at index uh, one and three uh, are outputting the accept value, which is zero. So in this case, what I'm doing is adding five for the try. And then if it's accept, I'm setting a value to zero. And then finally, I'm just depending whatever the try or the accept just determine the value to be. So this is a really efficient way to catch errors and allow you to continue forward in your script because you might be able to work with that zero in a particular way. Another type of loop um, that's less often used but still useful is the while loop. So the, the for loop runs for a predetermined number of items in a list. So if you have 10 items, it'll run 10 times. A while loop can be told to go forever if you want. It just relies on a condition. And as long as that condition is satisfied, then it will keep going and going and going. So the syntax is while condition, and then inset your, your what the script will do before it checks the while loop again. And then it will keep revisiting the while loop until it's satisfied. Um, I can show you an example of just how a while loop can be told to never finish. So let's just say while true. So I'm just specifying that it's always true, so it never finishes. And I'll just say, I wanna print, uh, I'll just print a string and I'll just print, uh-oh. <laughs> and when I play it, look, it, it never stops. It just keeps getting more and more and more. Luckily, I, I run in Pony, which has a stop command to stop. But you can see it just, it just generated, uh-oh, pretty much forever. So an example where we can stop is when the condition keeps changing. Let's say we're trying to find every time that we divide by two from a starting number by a divisor. We wanna know how many times we can do this before we go below one. So in this case, you can see we've got a start number, an end number, a divisor. Then we're setting a current value at the start. Uh, we could keep redefining the start value as its own variable, um, but in this case, I'm just finding it easier just to keep these two variables separate. So we pass the start value to the current value we make the results an empty list because we want to see which values um, are in, in this while loop. And whilst the current value is greater than the end, we keep appending that result and then dividing it by the divisor. So we're setting the current value to the current value on the divisor. So you can see it goes 10, 5, 2.5, 1.25. Then the while loop detects that it's smaller than 1 and it stops. So you can see that while loops do have some useful functions. There is a shorthand for the for loop. There is one for the while loop as well, but it's a bit more complicated, so I don't recommend using it, especially if you're a new user. Um, but the while loop can be, uh, that the for loop can be handy to put in shorthand sometimes if you're doing a very basic for process. Say just a simple multiplication over a list. So we just say, do this for i in this, but it's really important to note that we have to add a list bracket around the whole thing. Because what we're doing is we're undertaking taking an exercise in list comprehension in order to do this shorthand loop. So this essentially will generate a list as a result. So we could either assign this to a variable or we could print the result of the, while, of the for loop or we could add a print within the actual action of the for loop. So it might look a little bit like this. So all we're doing here is saying for in a range, the result is we want to double it. So we just say print the value times two, which is i, which is the variable we're defining locally, for i in the range of one to 10. You can see here, well, one, one to nine technically, we can see here that we have to close it in the list brackets in order to make it a list comprehension. But you could assign this to a variable to continue forward. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Um, it's really important that you understand this if you're gonna be using Python. So I highly recommend you give this some practice. Um, have a play with loops, try to understand the importance with local and global variables and how you can pass global variables into local, local loops. Um, and then once you're comfortable with this, um, feel free to jump to the next part where we're gonna look at zip iteration, which is a more complex version of a for loop essentially. So thanks for watching this part. Um, hopefully you found it useful and hopefully I'll see you in the next video when you finally understand the for loop. Thanks, take care, bye.